and I'll okay, and I'll do a screen share here. Okay, do we have that? Yep. How do we tell? Um, you should be able to see. I think um, it should slide. be up. Can you see his PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. Okay, I just need to see it now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see. Well, let's see here. Let me. Okay, I need to get some of this out of the way so I can. Okay, and. Okay, everybody got that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, okay, this is uh, this is a, a talk that really deals with one of the biggest controversies in the uh, Pacific Northwest here. Uh, an even uh, older controversy than the one that uh, Harlan Bretz brought about. This is the Olympic Wallawa liniment. And what, what I'm going to talk about here is the, uh, some of the recent work that uh, my colleagues and I have done. In fact, some of you re you'll recognize some of these names. You probably all, uh, or at least many of you know uh, Carl Fecht. You probably don't know Ingrid Hutter. She was a student of ours back when we did this. Uh, Terry uh, Tolan. Terry Tolan. Yep. Terry yeah. Tolan and, and Mickey Terry Jamness. And, and Mickey Jamness. And, and especially, uh, I want to give a special thanks to Bruce Bjornstadt. Because Bruce is, uh, uh, he, he's worked on a lot of this stuff with us, but he, uh, we were writing this paper, he uh, stepped in to give us a little hand. Now I'm going to send uh, you uh, folks a, uh, uh, a reprint of a paper called the, basically titled this, uh, A New Look at, the old, at an Old Controversy. And so when we start talking about this controversy, we're essentially talking about something we call the Olympic Wallawa liniment. And that was first recognized in 1947 by Erwin Royce of Yale University. And back then there wasn't a lot of good air photos or anything like that. And what Royce had done, he had taken a lot of topographic maps and he recognized that if you turn them the right way and kind of squint at them a little bit on the side, you'd see this, uh, this line, this liniment uh, or alignment of features going from, uh, oops, there it is, from, uh, from the Wallawa Mountains in northern Northeast uh, Oregon through our area up to the essentially following Interstate 95 and up to the uh, Olympic Peninsula. And he called that the Olympic Wallawa liniment. And he didn't quite know what it was and nobody really knew for a long time, but there were a lot of arguments and a lot of theories of what it was. And it played a prominent role in a lot of the, uh, the uh, earthquake hazard studies here on the Hanford site and around the Pacific Northwest. The two big arguments on it really were either is, it is a big giant strike slip fault, meaning that you know one side was moving this way and the other side was moving that way, or that it was a thrusted uh, structure that is this stuff down here in the south was moving north along this line here or essentially along here so there's really two ways the structure was moving uh, and nobody quite had the evidence for it back when royce was looking at it but uh, that was a big 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 uh, controversy for quite some time now if you go to the literature and uh, uh, there's a lot on it the prominent argument was that it was a big giant strike slip fault. In fact, uh, my old advisor from Washington State University, Peter Hooper, wrote a paper saying it had to be a major strike slip fault going through the area, going from up here in the Seattle to the north, to north or down to the, uh, the Wallawa Mountains. Uh, the portion of it we look at right around the Tri-Cities is called the Rattlesnake Wallowa Alignment, or we used to call it the RAW. And uh, that portion has played a really important part. And that's an area that my colleagues and I have studied for, well, we sat down and figured out the total amount of years that we've all combined on that. And we came up, we came up with over 200 years of, of research on this feature. And so we're gonna talk about this portion 
here. We're not going to worry about this up through here. Okay. Now this is probably hard to see. This is I'm going to show you better map in a bit. This is a, a digital image with a lot of things on it. And then, and again, I'm going to uh, send the uh, the preprint or the reprint of the paper over so you can download those and see it better. But basically, you can recognize things like the Horn of the of the Columbia here up towards Bruce Rapids Dam. And this right here is a blow up of all these things we call the rattles. These are the uh, the structures that uh, form Rattlesnake Mountain, Red Mountain, uh, Badger Mountain, etc. And then down here, when you get to Wallula Gap, we have something we call the Wallula Fault Zone. And this figure down here is kind of a blow up of that. And again, this is this was written for a paper, so it's probably a little hard to see. Uh, these right here are the names of the various structures. And we'll talk about those and be a little easier to see. But to get, get you the big picture here, we're gonna talk about the area from about uh, Priest Rapids Dam down to the Blue Mountains. And we're gonna break it up into parts. We're gonna start down here and work our way slowly up to Rattlesnake Mountain. This is probably a little better picture to see that stuff. This is our portion. There's Rattlesnake Mountain. Uh, there's Red Mountain. And you can see a few of these things right here. Well, the Olympic Low Liniment is kind of uh, morphed into a little bit more of a uh, detailed study of three different types of structures that we see in the Tri-City area. And again, that's where we're going to concentrate. So here's Priest Rapids Dam. Here's the Hanford site. There's Gable Mountain, Gable Butte out here, Rattlesnake Mountain Red, as I said. There are three structures. One structure is we call the Rattlesnake Wallula alignment. There's Rattlesnake Mountain. And you can trace that all the way down here past Badger Mountain to Wallula Gap. The other one, though, and this is something that Royce never recognized or talked about, there are two other structures. One is called the Badger Canyon Horn Rapids structure. And that's this one out here. And there's Badger Mountain, Mountain right there. There's Badger Canyon right there. And uh, you can trace the whole series of them. Here's the laptop, and it goes up to the Horn of the Rapids, Horn Rapids, and actually crosses over across the Yakima River and it kind of dies out onto the Hanford site. That's the third, second of these uh, structures. And it kind of dies out here at Badger Mountain, or Badger Cooley. We can't really find it farther to the south. But then we have the Horn Rapids, uh, or sorry, the Horse Heaven Hills alignment. And here's the Horse Heaven Hills. Benton City is out in this area here. And you can trace it down here. And they all merge towards Willow the Gap. Now, the one thing is just hardly ever, you hardly ever notice, if you go and drive Interstate um, 82, you pass Benton City, and you get to, you can look across the river, and you can see this little series of hills going up. Uh, that's we, that's a part of this uh, Rattlesnake Mount, or sorry, part of the uh, Horse Heaven Hills. So the Horse Heaven Hills actually continues on here. And when you get to Benton City, it decreases in, in amplitude. You don't see it as a very strong structure, but it's the same structure continuing up that way. And so what we've defined now is the Olympic Willow liniment is, are these three structures. And we're going to take a look at some of those here. Okay. I put this one simply because this is our telephone book of Columbia River Basalt. And we're not going to really talk a lot about any of the lava flows, but one, one thing I wanted to point out here is there's been a lot of new work that's been done on the basalt, especially by, by a woman named Jennifer Chrisholm at uh, Yale University. Uh, and she has shown that most of the Columbia River basalt was erupted in about 700,000 years, which is just amazing because that's about 99% of all the big, ugly black rock you see around here. It's coming out in just 700,000 years. And that's going to have a big impact on the structures. So when you see a structure forming, it's fighting the uh, basalt flows as well. Okay, so here's a here's a uh, diagram that shows you the places we're going to look at. We're first going to talk about the Wallula Fault Zone, which is the Olympic Wall liniment as it goes down into the Blue Mountains. And we're not going to really follow it down into uh, the Blue Mountains to all that far. And we're not going to go down to the uh, the Wallawa Mountains. Then we're going to move up here and we're going to look at uh, a couple of the structures. This area right here is where we have Badger Mountain and that this is uh, the Butte. Now, if you've ever been down to Findlay, there's a nice little quarry there that the, the county, Benton County operates and they quarry gravel out of it. 
And that's a pretty important geologic area because they've given us some really interesting looking geology in there. So we're going to talk briefly about that. And then we're going to move up to this area here. And then finally, we're going to go up to where Red Mountain uh, kind of dies out on the Yakima River. We pick up uh, Rattlesnake Mountain. And so we're going to just work our way up that way. Now we're down here. There's Willow Gap. Um, Willow, oh, sorry. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, the Walla Walla River. The Little of the Gap is going to be way up this way. Here's Milton Freewater, and here's the Blue Mountains down here. And this is something uh, we're going to kind of focus on for just a few minutes. Don Swanson, back in the 1970s, was doing a lot of mapping. Now, Don is, uh, you, you might have seen him on uh, Nova Pictures about the uh, Mount St. Helens. Well, Don is a native of Washington. He grew up over in Chehalis. He went to WSU to get his bachelor's degree. And then he went to work for the U.S. Geological Survey. And he, back when I started uh, working out here in the 1970s, Don and his, his colleague, Tom Wright, were mapping the basalts out here on uh, kind of on a regional scale. And uh, Don continued on. Now, again, Don's retired now, but his last stint was he was the... Uh, the scientist in charge of the Hawaiian Observatory over there. Uh, but he also was the chief scientist working on Mount St. Helens when interrupted. Well, Don and Tom Wright noticed something very important down here. They saw these dikes. And I'll show you a picture of a dike. If you've never heard of a dike before, it's essentially the conduit that a basalt flow comes up to the surface. And so you can think of it just like a dike. It looks like a dike. It's a fracture in the ground filled with basalt. And this is the stretch of the Olympic Willow liniment, the Willow Fault Zone, as we call it, or the Owl, uh, that was supposedly having all of this movement. It should have been moved, part of it should have been moving this way, and part of it should have been moving this way, according to some scientists. Well, Don was able to show that here are these dikes that are about 15 million years old crossing the liniment, and they're not offset. Now, if it were movement with this going this way and this going this way, kind of like the San Andreas Fault, this part of the dike should be way up here and this part should be way down here. And Don was able to show that it isn't, it isn't moving. In fact, Don came up with a really nice uh, saying when he gave a talk on this years ago, back in the 70s. He called the Olympic liniment the owl, he called it the owl, the fly-by-night structure. Okay, so there's one portion of it that kind of refutes the structure, the argument that there's a big strike slip fault. And this, there's no evidence of the rock up here going this way and the rock down here going that way. Now, this will blow your mind away. This is from our paper. And the only reason I put it in is to show you that we've gone from generalized maps like this to really detailed work on this. This is the same structure. Here are those those uh, features right down there, those are those dikes. And you can see all the faults that are in here. Here's the main fault going up to Wallula Gap. There's Wallula Gap right there. And we map it as a thrust fault. And I'll show you some of the evidence for it. There's a place we call the uh, Oxbow, which is right here. Here's the Walla Walla River. And it comes down and swings against the Horse Seven Hills. This is the Horse Seven Hills. And then the Walla Walla River goes off this way and eventually down this way. So, so the Walla Walla River has cut into the Horse Heaven Hills, uh, the southern extension or the southeast extension, and it gives us some really nice outcrops. Now, these are faults in here, and there are some dikes in here. There's more dikes in here, all these little black spots. We'll actually talk about one that's down this way in a little bit, but we'll go and take a look at some of the geology around here. Now, geologists like to use magnetic data. And this is something that Don Swanson with his colleagues back in 1979 produced. It's an aeromagnetic map. And what, it, what they did, they flew over the area here and Lula Gap is right around here to give you an idea where it is. And Hanford's up this way, but they flew over the area with a, with a magnetometer and they picked up just the magnetic intensity. And you notice what they see right here, these long features right there? Okay, those are actually aeromagnetic signatures and magnetic signatures of dikes. And again, here's the little, little fault zone down here. And so back in 1979, Don was able to actually 
uh, map some more dikes. These were not exposed at the surface. They were buried actually by younger flows. So we had these long linear features. I'll go show you a little bit more about that because this is 1979 here. Now here's a dike. Here's a dike. This is a dike cutting through the rock going up the hill here. And there's a lava flow there and a lava flow there. So this is what you're seeing on there's so aeromagnetic maps, except this is exposed to the surface. And the aeromagnetic map is really neat because it can look into the ground a bit. These all have very strong magnetic properties. Uh, the, one of the main minerals in this is magnetite. And magnetite, of course, is that nice magnetic mineral that makes compasses and such. Well, there was a US geological study back in 2016 using those aeromag studies. And the uh, authors of that said, oh, we have evidence for strike slip movement. And here's, here's the magnetic maps up here. Really a lot prettier than the one Don Swanson made. But of course, now we're at the, at the point where we can do all this with digital imagery and get really pretty colors. But here's the interpretation they put out. And they said, OK, here's this dike that comes down here. There's the, the essentially the, uh, the uh, oxbow that I'll talk about in a bit. And they said, oh, and that dike is offset over to here. And so this, they said, this is evidence for this going this way and this going this way. And see, see the little arrows there? So you have the dike being pushed that way and the dike being pushed that way. So they said, OK, we now know that the Wallula Fault Zone and the Olympic Wallula Liniment is actually a strike slip fault. Well, that's not quite the case because, uh, as I said, my colleagues and I that have been working on this actually were on the ground. We're kind of we're, we're what you would call field geologists. I think you all know Bruce Bjornstad. Bruce is a field geologist. George is a field geologist, and so am I. Which means we actually go out and look at the rocks, and we don't just look at aeromagnetic maps or anything like that. So in 1998, uh, Carol Flynn, Finn uh, produced another one, a more detailed map. In fact, you can see this is a really good one because here's the Olympic Wall Liniment up here. And actually, there's some other features. Here's Frenchman Hills. Here's the Saddle Mountains and whatnot. So there's the Horse Heaven Hills coming up like that. And there's those dikes, and they stand out very nice. And, and so my colleagues and I decided to go out and try and investigate these dikes and see what they're about. And we came across this. This is something that uh, I'm going to show you now uh, in the Walla Walla area. I'm going to show you three examples of how we were using those dikes to determine the movement on the Olympic Walla Limited. And the first one we're going to look at is Cameo Heights Resort, uh, the uh, a quarry there. Now, if you've ever been to Cameo Heights, you can, cross, you can go down there. It's a beautiful place to go. They have a great winery up there. It's a great place, a little too expensive for me to eat, but we always go to the quarry there. And I'll show you a picture of the quarry here in a bit. Then there's an, a, an example of a dike in that quarry. Now there's also a dike exposed along a road. This is Barnes Road down here. And there's a dike that's exposed there. And then here's the, the, uh, the uh, oxbow of the, of the Walla Walla River. And this we're going to spend a little time looking at. And what I'm going to show you is some examples of how we use field geology to actually try and figure out what's really going on as opposed to just looking at aeromagnetic maps. So, and again, here's aeromagnetic maps and don't worry about all these names. The lines here are our interpretation of where we have dikes and we just named them all. And don't worry, again, don't worry about the names. They're all dikes of the Columbia River basalt. But the important thing is this right here, this area right here is the oxbow. And based on our field work, we actually are able to show that there, that dike that we're going to so I'm going to show you the oxbow is actually down here as well as up here. So we'll go on here. Now, here is a great e example of geology in action. This is a quarry that was uh, right by Cameo Heights Resort. It was actually operated by the state of uh, Washington, and uh, as they were redoing. US-12, There's US-12, if you remember years ago, was just a nightmare to drive. And then about 20 years ago, they started re redoing the highway and they had to get road metal or what, what engineers call road metal with geologists called basalt to fill in places and whatnot. And they used this quarry. And what you're looking at here actually is the fault. But 
the neat thing along the edge of that fault is a dike. One of these lava flows came up and actually was faulted in here in this dike. This dike was faulted by the, uh, by the uh, movement of the rock here. So here we have a nice little dike in there. Okay. Now we're going to go a little bit farther south to Barnes Road. Here's another dike. It's less subtle. And I'll tell you, it, you have to really know what you're looking at to find this. If you take a look right here and right there, you'll see kind of yellowish stuff. That's the edge of the dike. The dike actually circles around like this. It was injected into the rock and moved up through the rock like that. Well, that dike has a very specific composition that we can use to identify which lava flow it was feeding. So like that big giant dike I showed you before, this one, however, is a really tiny one, but it's an important one because we actually can see it. Oops, we can actually see it and we know that it was feeding a lava flow nearby. Okay, then we're gonna go a little south here. And again, these are those aeromagnetic maps. We're gonna now move down the aeromagnetic signature because those dikes I showed you are actually uh, part of the signature here we see on aeromagnetic maps. Those maps are, these maps here are actually showing us where the dike is. And so we're gonna go to the third spot here, the oxbow down here. And we're going to look at that area and the geology there. And we're, this is an area called Dry Creek. And we'll talk about that last then, next then. Here's the Oxbow. And the reason we call it the Oxbow is because the, Ox, the you know, Walla Walla River has done a great job of eroding through this area and gives us a lot of it, nice geology information. It's not just, uh, you know, grass and, and uh, tumbleweeds or anything like that. Here's a geology map of the Oxbow. Now, north is this direction, as you can see right there. And there's a fault. Here's the main fault out there. And don't worry about the units. You can tie them in here. The oldest is this brown. And we get the younger and younger units up to this one. This is the critical one right here, because it's going to tell us a lot of information about what's happening here. But also, if you notice here on this thing, you see a little thing that says dike right there. That's the same dike that we saw on the other side of the fault up by Barnes Roads. And I'll drop back real quick here. OK, so we went from Barnes Road. We're now at the Oxbow. And the fault line for the Olympic Willow Linum is right there. And that's an important location because what we're seeing is the fault has not offset the dike, like that US Geological Survey report showed you or argued before. Here's the dike. And what's even more important is there are, see this thing that says vents? These are volcanoes or pieces of volcano from uh, an eight and a half million year old lava flow. And again, that eight and a half million year old lava flow forms one of the, the uh, dikes going up this direction. So we have actually two dikes in here, this dike right here and the one that's right here, and they're not offset by the Olympic law liniment. Down here is a cross section from there to there. And this just shows you how the rocks <coughs> are, uh, are folded. And you can see what they're doing is they're kind of curving down into the fault zone. There's the main fault zone, that's out here. And the rocks kind of fold down, oops. And here is one of those dikes of projection. And here's those volcanoes or pieces of volcanoes right there. And there's, of course, the layers. Yeah, there. So you can see what's happened is the rock has been folding over like that. The, and here's the fault. And the fault was moving this direction and also hit a back fold up through here. But it did not offset those dikes. And that's important geologic marker telling us that there is no movement that way or that way. It's that way. And here's that volcano up there. And of course, well, doesn't really look like much of a volcano, does it? But when, if you're a geologist and you go and look at this stuff, you'll recognize that it has all the markings of a volcano. It's uh, just little bits and pieces of it that are left. And the age of this is at eight and a half million years old. So uh, right away, you know that eh, you know, eight and a half million years is a long time to erode something. So that's our, uh, what we call our vent, where the volcano vented its uh, material at the surface. 
Now, the next thing we're going to do is that we were right here at the oxbow. Now we're going to go down here. And that vent produced what we called the Martindale flow, the eight and a half million year old Martindale flow. And if we go down to the oxbow or down to the uh, Martin, to the Dry Creek area right there, there is the same dike right there, right there. That's the same dike. And those, uh, this is Ingrid Hutter and her field assistant, Deanna Longi, right there uh, for scale. This is the ginkgo flow line above it. The ginkgo flow is about seven or about five, 15 million years old. The Martindale dike is about eight and a half million years old. So right away, we have good control on what's going on there. And so this is a kind of a, a simplified diagram. Here's the oxbow right here. The dike of the Martindale, the eight and a half million year old lava flow, the dike comes down here, crosses the Walla Walla River, and then we can trace it down here to the, uh, the Dry Creek area. And not like the US Geological Survey people said, oh, it's offset up here. This is the dike they were showing you. And this is the one where field work actually shows it is. And I'm gonna run back real quick and just show you their diagram. Okay, there it is. This is what the USGS was saying there, that this was the dike and was offset there, and this is the dike. Well, they didn't have any data. They weren't on the ground. They just kind of winged it. And so what we've done is we've actually shown that there is, in fact, the dike. We can see it in the field, and it's not up here. Like they said, it's down there. So right away, that's another piece of evidence that was very important for figuring out what's going on with the Olympic Lulao Liniment. And again, there's that nice fancy diagram again. Now we're going to go up to Wallula Gap. Here's Wallula Gap. And we're going to look at two places in Wallula Gap, in Wallula Gap. One right up here where the fault crosses. And then on the other side of the river, a place called Yelp Pit. So here we are. Here's, uh, this is north, that direction. And, or sorry, that's south. Uh, just, no, sorry, north. <laughs> I twisted around here. There's where we're going to look at first, and here's Yelp Pit next. And again, there's uh, this one right here is that arrow, and there's Yelp Pit right there. And you can see it looks really messed up, right? That's north direction going across there. That's Willula Gap. And here's some fractures and faults in there. But if you draw a cross section and look at the actual geology, and this would be where the uh, where the railroad terminal is, and uh, there's a port over here, Port of Walla Walla. We draw a cross section from across the US 12 there, US 730, I guess it is now. Here's the junction, 12 goes that way, 730 goes that way. If you draw a cross section, this is what the rock looks like, just like at the oxbow. It's kind of folding over and it's being broken and folded. And so we see the same thing going on there. Now, if we cross the river, <laughs> We see, well, this is the uh, Yelp Pit Canyon. And George was uh, uh, in this picture someplace, and I'm not sure where, George Last was in here. But back in, the, uh, in like 1978, uh, George and a bunch of other geologists trenched the fault over there at, uh, at Willowda Gap. And uh, they, what they found was that uh, there is a, the fault continued across the river, but was little flood gravel sat on top of it. And so the importance of that trench was to try and figure out the age of it. So right away, they were able to determine that at this portion of the fault, there was uh, actually Missoula floods covering it. So it's, it's older than Missoula, Missoula floods. Okay, now we're going to move up the river a bit, or up the, uh, up the length a bit there. And here's where we were at Missoula Gap. And here's all those little structures going around. There's the Horse Heaven Hills. And here's uh, Badger Mountain up in this way, Red Mountain, and then Rattlesnake. And what we're going to do is work our way up this way to Rattlesnake Mountain. And we're going to take a look at what these features look like. And if you remember, there's three features here. There's the Horse Heaven Hills. And Yellow Pit Fault was right here. We were on the other side of the river there. So here's the Horse Heaven Hills trend coming up this way. It's going to cross over. Then we have the rattles, as they were called, the, uh, the rattles, as we like to call them, last rattle, butte, whatnot, up here to Red Mountain, and then Rattlesnake Mountain. And then northern 
exposure there, the northern structure, Horn Rapids, Badger Cooley structure right there. We're going to concentrate on this stuff though, right here. Here's a series of cross sections that we've drawn through it. This is the one that would have gone through uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Willow Fault zone down there. And if you know the area, the Walla Walla River had been right here up against it. So that's probably what it looked like in cross section down by, uh, by the uh, Oxbow. If we move up to where Badger, Can Badger Mountain is and we bent back to the Horse Heaven Hills, this is what the geology would look like. <clears throat> and again, you're seeing kind of these nice little faults that move things forward. We call them thrust faults. And there's the Yakima Bluffs. And Richland tried to put a well in right there, which was a bust. But anyway, you can see everything kind of looks like it's always trying to move to the right, which be to, would be to the north. And then we get up to Rattlesnake Mountain, and there's the Horse Heaven Hills, and there's a big Yakima Valley, and there's Rattlesnake Mountain, and then off to Hanford and Cold. The big thing to gather out of these is you're seeing uh, evidence of the, of the rock trying to move from the south to the north. And so we'll look at some of these things in a more detail. So we're going to start here at the last rattle. And this is the south and this is the north. And this is a detailed cross section we put together. And you can see this area right here. This is the fault zone. This is all broken rock. And some of the rock has been eroded off. But you can see again, once again, it looks like the rock is trying to move forward, up forward, not trying to slide by each other. So there's one. That's the last rattle. Now we're going to go up to the butte. Okay. Okay, there's the butte. Okay, now the butte is, um, uh, again, here's a quarry. Finley's just up off the, off the uh, map right here. And you can take this road past the butte up this way up on top of, onto the horse heavens. And so here's a cross section through it, uh, essentially going from here to here. And you can see there's kind of a, uh, up the very top, that fault right there is kind of a, a nice vertical fault. And, but down in here, which we don't show the fault on this map, is this nice, what we call thrust fault, and it's trying to move things forward like that. And so really you got this kind of uh, block between the two is caught between uh, the rock being, uh, forced forward and upward. And if we take a look at the quarry, we see this. Now I'm kind of turn you, I have to turn you around. Uh, this is to the south, so that's south, and there's north, and this is north. And that's the way I took the picture because when you look at the quarry, you're looking this direction. So there's the fault right there. That's that fault we're talking about. And here's all that sediment in there. And the sediment reveals a very interesting history. There's probably at least about uh, four or five periods of, of movement of this fault zone through here, that, that block really more than anything else. And some of it is up into the Pleistocene. So Missoula flood sediments are incorporated into some of this uh, faulting right here. So now as we move closer to Tri-Cities, we're actually seeing evidence for right. younger, some younger faulting. We didn't see it down there with a little gap with the pit, but we get up here to the butte, and we do. Now we're going to move up to the next one. We're going to move up to Pipeline. And again, the same pattern. Everything's trying to move to the north. And then we'll go up to Thompson Hill, which used to have a winery on top of it. And now we used to call it Basalt Hill, but now it's called Thompson Hill. And again, it almost looks like the Butte where there's some wedge. It looks like this little block right here is trying to be squeezed up into there. Now, if you go up into this area, there's a nice little subdivision up in here now. People are building houses all over this, uh, this part of the hill right here. So uh, it's an interesting place, interesting place. People, for some reason, people like to build on faults. Okay, then we're going to move up here to Badger, Oops, up to Badger. Okay, and here's Badger right there. So we were at Thompson Hill. Here's Badger, and uh, Badger has two parts: Little Badger and Big Badger. So we'll take a look at that. Here's a, a 1979 photo of Badger Mountain, 
uh, you know, everybody looks at it and you say, boy, that doesn't look like Badger, does it? There's no houses on it. Well, here's a younger picture of Badger. There's Badger Mountain and Little Badger. And look at all the houses that have been built all around it. A lot has changed in the last 40 years. Well, because of that, uh, my colleagues and I were actually able to take advantage of all this building. And we were putting together a, a geologic map of this area. Here's a geologic map of Badger and Little Badger. These things right here are faults. That symbol right there is an anticline, and it just basically means it's folded. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment here. And so what we got here is a, is a fold, a little arch with a big fold on the front of it. And here's what, again, what it looks like, but it's not the simple fold. It is kind of a big badger. We have this nice big fault zone. And in fact, I'll show you some more pictures of this fault zone in a minute. And then here's little badger. And it's really complex in there, all kinds of little faults in there. It's, uh, you could kind of think of this as like trying to squeeze a, uh, a watermelon seed through your uh, nose. <laughs> Literally, you're squeezing everything out and it's popping out. And so we got all these faults that help accommodate the faulting. Okay. And here's what we, we put together some of that geology. We call this geology, urban, uh, urban geologic mapping. And here's a nice foundation. And you can see the rock here is kind of tilted. And so we can put together the geologic map in more detail when we have the advantage of looking at all those, uh, those foundations and whatnot. OK. Well, here we are. Here's Badger Mountain. You can see uh, this is looking at it from the south. And you probably recognize all these nice houses along here. This is in Badger Coulee. <clears throat> and here's the slope, south slope. Here's the north slope. And I have two pictures here. Here's one that was made when they had just cut the foundation for this house right here. And here's some all folding in there, folding in there. So a nice, lot of nice faults in Badger Mountain, just like we had shown on the, the diagram here. So that's a little Badger. And so one of those faults right there is one that you're looking at. That in fact, that's the look one you're looking at. R oops, right. There, okay. Then up, if you ever drive up onto Badger, where all the nice houses are, if you get up to the junction of two roads there, you'll see this funny looking outcrop. And of all things, this is what we call breccia or fault breccia. It's actually broken rock produced by the faulting. And notice this little white stuff in there. This is something that uh, is where we bring the uh, Ice Age Flood Institute together with, uh, with the uh, basalt geology. This is a clastic dike of Missoula, fault, of, uh, Missoula uh, flood sediments that's been injected into the fault zone. And what that's telling us is that when Glacial Lake uh, Missoula or Glacial Lake uh, Lewis was here, there was probably enough pressure put on the faults through here that they triggered them to move. And as they moved, a lot of the sediment that was in the lake at that time was injected into the fault. And so right away, we have a pretty good idea that this fault last moved when Glacial Lake Lewis was here. So, and you can go up on, and you can, you can literally stand on the road, look across the fence and see this very easily up there on, on Badger up in here. Okay, if we go up to the freeway, this is something that uh, uh, my colleagues and I were uh, able to do when uh, the uh, uh, freeway was first being built. Now, if you drive this road here, there's the houses up there on Badger. If you drive the road, you'll notice that it's really not all that uh, well exposed. Uh, we were pretty fortunate to have this picture, thanks to our colleague Bruce Bjornstadt and his wonderful drone, because we were trying to figure out how are we gonna get a good picture of this for the paper. And uh, we thought, oh, there's Bruce. Bruce Bjorn said. So we cornered Bruce. We didn't corner him. We just asked him, can you get your drone out and get us a nice picture of this, of this area so we can in, uh, put the geology on it? And Bruce was more than happy. He said, sure. And so Bruce uh, flew this and then we, we put the geology on it. Well, this white line right there is a thrust fault. That's a big thrust fault. It's one of the ones on the Big Badger thing. And I'll go back and show you. Well, actually, here it is down here. This is a detail of what we mapped 
in that road cut right there. And there's the fault there. And then this stuff right here is over here. So what you're looking at right there is essentially that outcrop. And if we go back here to the cross section, uh, here's Big Badger Mountain. You're right. essentially looking at one of the, this fault right here uh, as it snakes up the hillside. So there it is, that fault snaking up the hillside right there. Now, if we move a little bit farther to the Northwest, we're gonna get the Candy Mountain. And again, you're gonna, if these maps look familiar, uh, they will, look, if they don't look familiar now, they'll look familiar in probably, I'm not sure how long, but uh, Carl Feck, Nikki Chamnus, and a little bit of help from me, put these maps together and we sent them over to the Washington Geological Survey where they're putting them together and they're gonna issue them as uh, maps through the state. But what we designed them for is for the kiosks at uh, Candy Mountain and Badger Mountain. And when they get all these out, I think they already have the pictures or the maps on the kiosks. If not, they'll have them soon. But you'll be able to go to the Washington Geological Survey's webpage and download the map itself and with, the, with these geologic maps on them and cross sections. So anyway, here's the one at Candy Mountain. And again, here's that big fault, the one where everything's moving northward. Here's the symbol showing it's a fold, it's a little arch. And so we're gonna look at this one first. And then we're gonna look here. This is uh, what we call Cory Gap. This is old US 12, Kennedy Road now that comes through. And here's where they're my, they're, the, uh, the folks from uh, Cone and Quarry are mining uh, out the basalt right there. And then we're gonna look at, uh, at what we call Lost Lake Ridge. And we call this out here the uh, Ke uh, Keen Road Syncline, which is syncline, if you've never heard the word before, it's just a trough, a folded trough, the rocks folded. Here's the Goose Ridge Syncline in the back. So you have the rocks folded into a trough, then here they're folded into an arch, and here they're folded into a trough. And there's your little scale up there. And again, there's Candy Mountain. That's what it looks like. So if you hike up the trail to Candy Mountain, if you could see into the rock, that's what you'd be looking at right there. And that big zone on the north side, that's all broken rock. If we go into the Quarry Gap, notice how the rock just peters out. It, the faults are still there, but they're not really that big anymore. And what you're looking at here now is the ridges declined and you have this kind of low area between the ridges, but there's still a fault in there. And if we move to the Northwest a little bit more onto Lost, what we call Lost Lake Ridge, uh, this part has kind of been eroded away. So we've added it back in, but we're starting to get the structure coming up again. So we end up with this nice anticline, as we see a fold there, nice what we call an anticline. Here's the Keen Road syncline out through there. Now we're gonna move a little bit farther to the uh, Northwest and here is Red Mountain. And we're gonna look at two things. Well, we're gonna look at one thing on Red Mountain. We're looking from uh, West Richland towards Red Mountain. So this would be off to the West. And there's a nice well right in here, some houses that were built up here and they put a well in and we got the chip samples for it. And we were actually able to uh, identify the fault that uh, formed this ridge here. But we get to the road, rail, the old railroad cut there, the old northern, <clears throat> was it northern uh, Pacific Railroad cut. Uh, that now the railroad's all gone, but the cut's still there. We actually get to see a fault, and here it is. We're looking off to the east now, and here's a nice, here's actually a good view of a thrust fault. The rock has moved this way compared to this, and so when you start to make these structures form they kind of buckle and they have to account for the shortening. So they end up with faults, faults like that. So all these structures that we were showing you, when we start showing the thrust faults, they're, and all those little faults are all accommodating, trying to deal with space. Mother nature doesn't like vacuums and mother nature doesn't like to have uh, too much rock in one spot. So she just shifts everything around to account for what's going on. And so here you are, this is in the, the old railroad cut with an actual thrust fault along Red Mountain exposed in there. And if you've ever driven from Benton City up to Horn Rapids, uh, what, you, what you get a chance to do is see this. What you're seeing here is Red Mountain coming down 
and we're heading towards Rattlesnake Mountain. Notice Red Mountain just drops off to nothing. And there's just level of basalt flows out through here. This is a continuation of that, of this right here. And it continues across. Here's the Yakima River in there. And then all of a sudden, we come up on the Rattlesnake Mountain. That's a really important area for the geologists because it shows us that any fault that we had over here in that railroad cut, by the way, was right out really about where that marker is there. Uh, that railroad cut uh, fault just dissipates and we don't have any faults along here. If this were a, a strikes of fault with rock moving that way versus that way, this would have to continue on to account for the rock, uh, the space of the rock. Rock just doesn't disappear. You know, it has to move, move and you can't just die it out. Thrust faults can die out because as uh, the elevation and the uh, structure relief on Red Mountain there decreases, then you don't need a fault anymore. And so we go across here. And so that's a very important spot for helping figure out what's going on. Now we're going to move to Red uh, to Rattlesnake Mountain. So here we were, there's a nice Google image, Red, Red Mountain's here, here's Rattlesnake Mountain. And so we're going to look at two spots on Rattlesnake Mountain. One right here, we're going to look into there. And then we're going to go into Bobcat Canyon, which is a little bit farther to the west there. Here's a geologic map, very confusing, I'm sure, but it shows you one thing. North is that direction, and here's that big fault. Now the fault picks up as Rattlesnake Mountain picks up and continues up this way. And then we're going to show you how that fault kind of changes a bit. And then all of a sudden, Rattlesnake Mountain, the northwest trend of the Olympic Willow Liniment kind of dies and stops. And all of a sudden, we have this east-west structure which is another story. Okay, so here's our Rattlesnake Mountain picture. Here's the main fault along the base of it that stands out. There's kind of an upper fault right through here. And there's the top of Rattlesnake. And here's some of the basalt names we call. The upper part of the basalt, upper part of Rattlesnake Mountain is made up of what we call the Saddle Mountain Basalt, which is young basalt. And then we have the Wanapum Basalt. So that's not that important as far as the names are concerned, but Again, the important thing is this stuff has moved forward here compared to this stuff out here. So we're picking up the elevation on Rattlesnake Mountain by just stacking cards on top of each other. And of course, you get faults to help uh, alleviate that problem of cards. And there's kind of our Rattlesnake Mountain diagram. Here's the crust of Rattlesnake Mountain. Here's the lava flows. And you get to the north side, and they're kind of tilted over. Rattlesnake Mountain wanted to fold over like that. And here's kind of what's left of that fold. But if you've ever tried to fold uh, or bend a plate of glass, it doesn't do well. Now, when I was a kid and, and my, uh, my friends and I would play baseball in our yard, occasionally we would try and bend the plate of glass that consisted of my neighbor's window. And it didn't bend very well. It kind of fractured and broke. And that's really what's going on here. The, the basalt doesn't bend, it's brittle, and therefore it breaks. And that's what you're seeing there, the breaks. Okay, And that's what you're looking at right there. There's that lower fault, there's that upper one. You go back, there's the upper fault, there's lower fault. Again, lower fault, upper fault, and that. So that's typical of a lot of these structures. You get breaking. It doesn't bend very well, it breaks. OK, next thing we're going to do is go over here to Bobcat Canyon. Oh, I, I don't want to, I can't forget this. One of the arguments, again, by people, uh, the geologists in the past, prior to the study that uh, my colleagues and I did, was that Rattlesnake Mountain had strikes of faults on it, evidence of strikes of faults. And here's a Google image, and this is what they'd say. They'd say, oh, look at that drainage right there. See, it goes down, and it's offset, or it's offset there. You have all these offset drainages, and that's proof that Rattlesnake Mountain was going, that part was going that way and that part was going that way. You know, look at this drainage right here, offsets. And we say, no, we actually have been on the ground and you're not looking at offset, what you're looking at is alluvial fans. And that's when you got to come up to this one right here. This is essentially the same area as down here, but what you're looking at, see, is a stream coming out of Rattlesnake Mountain. And look what that looks like. It looks like alluvial fan. It's carrying sediment down here. And as soon as it gets past the main fault right there, the sediment spreads out. And what's happening with the drainages? 
Well, there's an alluvial fan there, there's an alluvial fan there. And what's happening is the drainage just kind of go in the low area and fall out like this. So we're all these geologists that were looking at air photos and making big arm waving interpretations. Uh, they were saying it strikes a faulty. Those of us that were on the ground, uh, like uh, my colleagues and Bruce Bjornstad actually worked out in here too, and he noticed the same thing. We all recognize that no, it was an alluvial fan and the drainages are not offset. They're just taking the path of least resistance. And if you get on the ground, which this next one is, here we're on one of the alluvial fans here. There's an alluvial fan there. There's another one. This is the north face of Rattlesnake. And you have all these nice alluvial fans coming out. But one of the important things about geology is you can't really do air photo interpretation without doing the groundwork. And that's kind of what my colleagues and I have done. And you all know Bruce Bjornstad and George Glass, and that's what we all do. We like to get out on the ground and do, do the work on the ground and not necessarily, we like to use the air photos, but we like to make sure we're looking at the ground. Okay, the last place we're gonna look at is Bobcat Canyon. Uh, you'll never get into this place. Uh, Carl and Bruce and George and I all got into it when we all worked at Battelle and Battelle operated the, uh, the area prior to the National Monument taking over. So we're going to look at this area here. And OK, there's my thing. We're going to be looking into there in the next photo here. So there we are. We're looking into Bobcat Canyon. And these are basalt flows that are kind of tilted over. Now, what I've done is I've gone over to this other hill, and we're looking back at these guys. And that's what we're doing here. And so what you're seeing are lava flows that are tilted like that. And here's that anticline. This is the uh, anticline that makes up Rattlesnake Mountain and the Olympic Wall Liniment. And it's disappearing. It's literally becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And what's happened here is actually we have another thrust fault on top of it. All this rock on top here has been thrust or shoved up on top of the anticline. And so what you're looking at here is the end of the Olympic law liniment as a geologic feature in the Tri-Cities. It dies out. And if this were a strike to the fault, that would not be the end of it. Now, the structures take off as you go farther to the uh, northwest. But in our area, this is essentially the end of the Olympic law liniment structures. You have to go over to, uh, to uh, the Yakima Canyon and farther to the west. Take Interstate 82 up towards uh, Ellensburg and Yakima, and there you're going through a whole series of those structures. But the important thing is, it's not one giant continuous structure. It's a series of small structures that die out. And so that kind of leads us to the end of this and the conclusion. And again, I always love to quote Don Swanson, Sometime in the 70s, he's called the Olympic Law Limit, the fly-by-night structure. Back in the 70s, with the work he was doing on the ground, he recognized it was not a big giant strike slip fault. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't a, dry, a big giant strike slip fault before the basalts were erupted. It could have been. We just don't know. It's probably a very old structure that all these uh, Columbia River basalt flows covered over. But one thing about geology, when you have an old structure, sometimes it gets reactivated by new, new forces. And that's what we're looking at here. When we look at the Olympic Bilal liniment in the Tri-Cities and down to Wallula Gap and over to uh, the Blue Mountains, we're looking at essentially a series of structures that were no longer doing anything but just thrusting to the north. The whole area is under north-south compression, being squeezed like a vice and the basalt flows are responded. And probably that old ancient structure uh, was kind of the, uh, the force or the uh, focal point for a lot of this folding and, and folding. So what we're essentially saying is, yeah, the deformation has probably continued long for many, many millions of years, long before the Miocene and the age of the basalts. However, one of the big problems when you talk about Hanford or anything else around here is there have been a lot of trenching studies and there's a lot of mixed conclusions. Like I said, if you look at the work that was done down at uh, Yelp Pit Canyon, the fault is overlain by uh, Pleistocene gravels. If you go to the Butte, you have uh, 
faulting that showed that uh, the U.S. Geological Survey was able to show is, is fairly young. And then you go up in the Badger Mountain and you have Missoula flood gravels or flood sediments, Tushy beds incorporated into the fault zone. So we don't know a lot about the history of it, but it looks like not everything is moved as one giant fault zone, but it's moved probably uh, as bits and pieces. And since then, really, uh, we haven't had any big giant earthquakes around here that uh, have been on there. The Hanford site, uh, George and I and Bruce were involved in uh, the last uh, study of uh, hazards, uh, seismic hazards, earthquake hazards on the Hanford site. I think that was done probably about eight years ago or so. And they can, we all can kind of concluded that uh, probably the, the, uh, the last big earthquake was 10,000 years ago. We all, and the, uh, the study kind of concluded that places like Rattlesnake Mountain can probably produce a magnitude seven and a half earthquake, but there has, hasn't been one for over 10,000 years. And that's probably the good news. Uh, the bad news may be, as we tell students, uh, well, even though uh, you have maybe a, a magnitude seven and a half earthquake every 10,000 years, the last one was 10,000 years ago. So who knows? You can't predict earthquakes. So at that point, I'll stop. You all have a pretty good idea of how, the, uh, how your local structures look. And again, well, what we'll do, I think this is going to be a YouTube video or something. You can all look at it again. And I'm going to send uh, your uh, president there a uh, uh, reprint from the, geological, the Bulletin of the Geological Society of America that we published this year that has this uh, pretty much talk in it. It's, it's written technically, but I think uh, you probably all, I, from my experience with you folks, you, you may claim not to be geologists, but you really are. So at that point, I think I'll stop and pass it back to your president. And I'll answer any questions I, I can here, if I can figure out how to do that. Okay. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation and I really enjoyed learning more about that. Um, does anyone have any questions for about our talk or? Yes, I've got a question. This is uh, John Sirkovsky. Hi, John. Uh, hi, Steve. It's good to uh, know that you're still kicking out there. I think I am anyway. All right. Uh, that was a great talk. I enjoyed it. I'm wondering, um, is there uh, what is the source of the um, compression that's that's apparently driving this uh, this thrust faulting? I mean, is that what is it? That is a that is an excellent question, an excellent one, and the answer is, oh, who knows? Here's here's the thing. One thing I I didn't talk about is that if you go into a lot of the uh, studies now that are being done. Um, using uh, the global positioning system, it turns out the, uh, the uh, Pacific Northwest is caught up in this big giant swirl. If you're down in Oregon, uh, the crust is kind of moving to the, to the west. If you get over in the coast, it's kind of moving north and to the northeast. And, the, and so you get to where we are and the people that do the GPS work, this, uh, use the global positioning system, say that the crust is moving kind of to the northeast. Well, that's fine, except for one problem. Uh, the problem is that you have all the earthquake focal mechanisms saying that, that in the Columbia Basin and uh, in our regional area, uh, we have north-south compression. And I've asked some of the people that I know that have worked with the GPS stuff, and I say, well, how do you resolve the two? Because uh, we're all, they're all going to be ultimately caused by the uh, interaction, interaction between the Pacific plate and the North American plate. You're going to have to have that as being the main tectonic driving force. And the argument for, the, uh, for the, this kind of clockwise rotation in the Pacific Northwest is, well, the, inter the uh, Pacific plate kind of moves uh, at a, uh, at not directly into the North American plate, but it kind of moves at an angle and you kind of get this rotational shear set up. And this is something that's been argued for, oh gosh, probably 40 years now that, 
they've used various pieces of evidence saying there's, you can almost think of like a whole bunch of marbles on the west coast that are kind of rotating clockwise. And the GPS says, okay, this is still moving. This is causing us to move up here. Uh, and when you look at a map of that, I should have probably set one up here. But when you look at a map of, of all this, it looks as you take Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, and it just looks like a giant whirlpool. And the whirlpool is kind of dying down where we are. So to answer your question, John, I have no idea anymore. <laughs> we just know that there are north-south compression impressive forces here based on earthquake studies. And actually, uh, back in, uh, in the old BWIP project, we did some deep borehole uh, studies that showed that uh, if you go down, say, uh, a couple of thousand feet, the pressures are north-south oriented, and they're twice what the uh, load pressure would be from just putting rock on top of it. So there's a tremendous amount of north-south compression over here. But you also have the global positioning data that kind of shows the uh, Earth is moving clockwise. In fact, I will, Liz, I will send you a picture that you can put on the web for everybody that uh, it's a, a friend of mine who now lives in uh, Hood River, Oregon. He's no longer doing this, but he published his last paper about, I think about five years ago. And it's a really nice one. Uh, you know, I, if you believe in the global positioning system, uh, it's gives you really interesting data. The question is how on earth does this uh, all fit together? And that's the thing about geology. Some young geologist in the future is going to have to figure that out. I'm too old for that right now. <laughs> How's that for an answer, John? <laughs> uh, that's, that's good enough for me. Um, if I could follow up though, um, I'm wondering, okay, so obviously this faulting um, and folding predated <laughs> most of the basalt flows. Um, and my understanding is that the source of the basalt may, I don't know if this is current theory, you know, was associated with the uh, moving hotspot that is now under Yellowstone. Yep, mm -hmm. that's, um, the, that's the idea. Could, could there be something in that hot spot that is causing these weird uh, forces uh, that, that may not be so much associated with a um, you know, subduction zone uh, uh, along the Pacific coast, but maybe more to do with the hot spot? Uh, yeah, the, uh, if you, the uh, people that model hot spots shown when you have a hot spot up here and, and the hot spot for the, the produce of basalts would have been down at the Oregon, Idaho, Nevada border. That as that hot spot came up, it would have had forces coming out in all directions and it would have pushed to the north. And so you could argue that back during the Miocene 15 million years ago to maybe about uh, 10 million years ago, there was this nice north-south push. But the trouble is now the hot spot is sitting under Yellowstone and those forces would have been gone by now. So you can't use the Yellowstone hotspot for those forces. I don't think they'd be residual enough to stick around all this time. Uh, the forces are up there at, uh, at Yellowstone. In fact, there's a paper uh, that just came out recently that uh, is arguing that a lot, of the, a lot of the uplift in the West, particularly in Idaho and and Wyoming and uh, Utah is directly responsible to, or is a direct response to that Yellowstone plume, but it's actually uh, pushing uh, the, the crust up and causing forces going out in all directions. So it works nice for uh, Yellowstone right now. It doesn't work very well for the present time in the Columbia Basin though. Mm -hmm. And okay, well, I'm, I'm, has... I'm, I'm heading to uh, Yellowstone next week. So I'll, I'll check it out when I'm there and let you know yeah. if, uh, if we're getting any uh, any uh, northward, uh, you know. Well, you you're, know, a hot, spot, a hot spot ought to be a result in, you know, if it's anything like weather, it ought to result in a uh, clockwise uh, circulation by, by the Coriolis <laughs> force. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe we're looking at all residual stuff, but yeah, yeah. it's kind of a far stretch to go from, uh, yeah. I think the, uh, they figure the hot spot left 
us about uh, at least about 10 to 12 million years ago. So you have 10 to 12 million years with that force having to to uh, kind of die down. Yeah. And uh, I think the everybody everybody that I know that deals with this kind of says, oh, everything's related to the the subduction zone, but nobody quite figures out how it's going to go. You know, that's the nice thing about geology. They're just you know, there's too many unknowns to give you a really good, clear answer right now. Something for people to work on. Okay, anybody else? Well, Thank you know you. how, oh, you know how, anybody has a question, you know how to get to me. I'm, I'm, uh, I've got an email address at WSU. You just, uh, it's srydell at wsu.edu. And uh, you can always, if you think, of, if you wake up at three in the morning with a question, you can always type it out and send it to me and I'll do my best to answer it. But in the meantime, as I said, uh, what I'll do then, Liz, I'll send you the, the uh, reprint PDF file that you, anybody can download and read. Again, it's, it's written for the geologic community. But I'll also send you the, uh, the pictures that uh, Rob uh, McAfee has done with the GPS data it will show you the issues. And again, I, as I said, I've asked a lot of people the same question, John. I don't know. Nobody seems to come up with the right answer. It's always been one of the big questions. Why do we have north-south compression? Why do we, you know, you can explain the uh, GPS movement, but you can't explain the north-south compression. But it's there. It's their data is good, hard, solid data. What about the 1936 Milton Freewater earthquake? Isn't that a big anomaly? Not really. That's uh, right now. The uh, uh, Brian Sherrard from the U.S. Geological Survey has been working on that. They wrote a paper a little while back, and they think that it occurred on the uh, the Olympic Wall liniment. However, nobody's been able to find the fault scar for it. But I don't know if it's, I call it an anomaly because that part of the, uh, you know, all this, all the structures we've been talking about are very capable of producing up to a magnitude uh, five to seven magnitude earthquake. Uh, rattlesnake seven magnitude, you go down to uh, the Milton Freewater area uh, and the, uh, the structures down through there and they could produce a five magnitude with no trouble at all. So there's- You mentioned- uh, oh, Sorry, I was ahead. gonna say- I was going to say, you mentioned the homes being built on uh, Badger and some of those areas. Do you have any concern about those? Well, you always have a concern about things being built on, uh, on uh, geologic structures, especially when you don't know how old they are. But there's an interesting story that I don't have a lot of concern about the houses that are built up on, on Badger. Uh, a fellow I worked with, and I think, uh, I think he taught a, a class over at WSU for a while. I don't know if he still does. Mike Black, he got a, a bachelor's degree in mining and engineering at the University of Idaho. And uh, George and I and Bruce worked with him. And Mike became, when, when our projects ended, Mike became an independent consultant. And there was a house that was built over by Canyon Lake, gosh, decades ago. And it was one of these nice, nice multi-million dollar houses right above uh, the golf course. And uh, <laughs> the... Uh, fellow that bought it, uh, moved everything into it, and then he started watering his lawn. Well, it turned out the, uh, the house was built partly on the salt flows, but partly on the sedimentary inner bed below it. And his uh, kitchen just started to slide away on that, uh, on that sediment as it got wet, the sedimentary layers between the basalt flows. And so the Benton County uh, Building Department realized they might have a problem and they started requiring engineering studies for any of these houses like on Little Badger. Well, our friend Mike Black would put his, uh, he was a consultant at that time and he decided, well, I'll just put my mining engineering uh, uh, background into work. And so what Mike did is he talked to builders and he said, listen, I can anchor your footings and your foundations into Badger Mountain so they won't slide like that. So there's something Mike learned how to do. It was called rock folding, and they do it in uh, in mines when they were uh, mining out ore bodies, and they get this big open area, and they were afraid of collapsing ceilings, and they rock fold the ceiling uh, in these stopes in that 
And so Mike started rock molding people's foundations into the hillside. He'd get a big drill rig in and they'd go in 50, 100 feet till they got really good rock. And then he's, they put in these big uh, giant bolts and uh, fill it with concrete, the hole with concrete, and they bolt the people's houses to uh, these things. They were never going to move at all. So I don't think they have to worry about those things. If they have an earthquake there, they may get cracks, but they're not going to slide down the hill. That's for sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. Back to, you know, one thing that Benton County uh, Building Department did is, uh, I don't think, I don't know about the uh, planning people, but the building department, the people on the ball, anybody that wants to build on one of these uh, structures, even out towards Prosser, they have to go through an engineering study to make sure they're not going to build on a landslide or anything like that. So uh, so the engineers in the building department have been on the ball. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're on top of it, so I don't worry about it. Uh, if they give a permit to somebody build on one of those things, I think they're they're doing their due diligence. Thanks for your presentation. Very interesting. Good. Okay. Well, I guess we'll just end there. It's after eight, and, uh, mm -hmm. and as I so said, much. if anybody has a question, you know how to get a hold of me. <clears throat> yep, I'll make sure to send out all that material. Um, and thank you again so much for your time. Well, happy to do it. Okay, everyone. Well, have a good rest of your evening. I'll log off here then. All right. See y'all next okay. time. Okay. Bye.